Grand Hotel from 1932. This is um, when you suggested this movie a couple weeks ago. I immediately watched it right away. Um, very awesome. Why don't you give a little background in the movie? Well, first of all, what did you think of it? Oh, I I definitely enjoyed it. Okay. Was what it the I first really time watching like, it? What I really like, and the reason even I love doing these with, with you is, I'm very empathetic. So as soon as I tune in to watch this movie, I put myself in 1932. And I imagine myself, because, you know, the movie won Best Picture. Yes. So I know that it's it's obviously was regarded <clears throat> highly. But then again, I'm also going into it knowing a lot of these actors, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I definitely enjoyed it. I watched, I always, I'm a trailer, trailer fanatic. So I watched the trailer before. And um, I, I was, I thought it was very good. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of funny you mentioned that you know I won the Oscar for Best Picture, but because here's the thing, like when I was thinking about, I'm like, you know, what movie should I do is, you know, and I was thinking and thinking and going back, you know, for some reason, the last handful of movies I've done for you, last two, have both, but I mentioned this, you have both been from 1947, oddly enough, and that was just a coincidence. It wasn't just like I was like I'm gonna pick two movies from 1947. So I was looking through and I was thinking of another movie to do. And I was like, well, this was made 1948. I'm like, that's too close to 1947. So let me go back a little bit even further. So I was reading um, a few nights before I watched this again. I was reading something on this and it kind of stuck out. Now, I'm not a guy who takes, like, I'm not a big fan of the Oscars. I don't really watch the Oscars anymore. I really haven't, honestly, since... uh, it, it, this might be a little childish, but since uh, Daniel Day Lewis didn't win Best Actor for Gangs of New York, I was like, "Screw these! These are not even." Now, real. up until that point, though, up until that, were you were you a fan up until that moment? I wouldn't say a huge fan. I, I would I'd watch them and okay. just pay attention to kind of see who won. Um, but you never gave any more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Juice to the movies at the Oscars than you did any other movies. No, not really. I really didn't. That makes sense. And that's that's good. Well, I'd still watch the show and kind of see who won, who was nominated, and so on and so forth. But after that, I, I, I haven't watched it. Like, you know, I, if I'm flipping through and it's on, I'm just kind of stuck. I'm still keep flipping. I'm like, you know, I'm like, whatever. I don't care. I'm like, after, like, it's like, after that happened, I was like, we are living in a simulation. This isn't real. <laughs> like, the fact that he didn't win was just... <laughs> It was it was it was stupid, but um, but this movie in particular, I heard this there at night, and I was like, you know, I'm like, I'm gonna go back and watch this again. Uh, this is the only movie, and you may already know this, but of any Oscar winner ever that's won Best Picture that was not even nominated for anything in any other category. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so like the actors. Um, it's crazy uh, because it came out in 1932, and, and since that time, that hasn't happened at all. But just crazy all, over in general. Yeah, and, and, but and, and granted, back then you had didn't have nearly as many categories as you do now. But you got to think, you know, from and so this came out in 1932. So 1933 is when uh, the Oscars were held that had this included in it, and from 1933 all the way to today. Any movie that has been nominated or won Best Picture has had, I shouldn't say won Best Picture, has been nominated for something in another category. You know, whether it's someone on the production crew or whether it's the director themselves or, you know, the actors, whatever. But it was pretty amazing that, like, it's been that long, you know. I mean, that's 90, that's 90 years now. Yeah, this movie I mean, came out in thirty two, so that's that's ninety years ago. I just can't. I, that still, I'm still in shock about that because that was one yeah, of the things that I read, and I was like, and the performances are there. I'm shocked that they couldn't find you know any of these people to be nominated. I mean, but no, and 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 you know the people in the movie, you know, some of them are nominated very for various things here and there, but like, I mean, if you look at the cast, it's uh, is a star studded cast. It's basically your first ensemble cast. It's Which is really it's, it's, what... it's the Ocean's Eleven of its day, you know, yeah. kind of in a way. Everyone kind of want to be together on this, and and they the egos were kind of put aside. But um, it, it's it's a great movie for for some for for several reasons because it was like I said the first for 
uh, a cast like this all come together and kind of share the top billing and, and, and share the, you know, basically the same amount of screen time as each other. So this movie was released by MGM in 1932 and it starred uh, the head. I mean, the main headliner for the movie, technically, if you want to be, if you want to get specific about it was Greta Garbo. And she made a few talkies before this, but I think Anna Christie was her first talkie, but you know, she, everyone in this, in this movie were, you know, this is still the infancy of sound films. You're only what five years removed from the jazz singer. So, these people all made made their bones in silent pictures. So I never really thought about that. You know, I never yeah, thought all about them. Joan Crawford really making her bones in the silent movie. Or yeah, she made several of them, and she always played, uh, you know, kind of a seductress. Not always, but she she was well known for that. As you know, they called him the vamp back then. You know, in those days, and you know, Greta Garbo was more of a glamorous star. She was probably the most glamorous. Uh, back in the in the late 20s you, i mean you had a handful of actresses that were kind of on her level but the way she was the way she was portrayed uh she was always in roles that were kind of she kind of played not the same character but like her demeanor was kind of always the same in each one of those pictures so but she starred in a few of uh silent movies with uh, the silent film star john gilbert who was a big male lead back in the 20s and it's kind of funny because I always confused him with John Barrymore, who's in this movie. Because if you look at them side by side, they look very similar. Gotcha. So it's kind of natural. You know, sometimes I'll see pictures of John Gilbert and Greta Garbo and be like, oh, John Barrymore. I'm like, oh, I mean, it's not John Barrymore, it's John Gilbert. But either way, it's neither here nor there. But um, John Barrymore actually came on board because he wanted to act with Greta Garbo so bad that he took a three picture deal from MGM and just to get in the movie with her, didn't really care what the other movies were. I couldn't even tell you what the other movies were. Honestly, <laughs> he did, but he it's just, cool back like, the way they like, did that. Do they, do you know, do they still do that picture deals? Is that how it still works or? I don't think so. I mean, or that's a goal. Is, I, I never really thought about that and doing this show the yeah, whole time. Talk about picture deals. That's stuff. I, I don't think it's like that because the studios back then, and I mentioned this on a previous piece of death. I don't know if it was sure it was late. In, I think it was, it was late in the lake where the studios had such power back then. Mm. And you worked for them. It was, it was, it was basically like, I liken it like Hollywood to major league baseball. Gotcha. Where you had the reserve clause in Major League Baseball for years and years and years and years and years, where you worked for, you know, one owner and they could do whatever they wanted with you. You know, there was no free agency back then, and this is kind of the way Hollywood was at the time too. Now, big time actors and actresses had to have a little more power because they could sign a deal, and then once they were done with that deal, they could go somewhere else. But like owners and you know major league baseball you know had you know basically the ceos of these film studios would collude with each other and say okay well if this person's gonna you know be difficult in their negotiations then we won't sign them either you know they kind of made those agreements those little gentlemen's agreements they call gotcha. them back then so it kind of gave them limited power but you know stars like greta garbo it kind of didn't matter at that point. Like, you know, I'm talking about a list, like the superstars of the day. Another movie studio is not going to be like, like you're not, like you're not going to have like, you know, Harry Cohn from RKO, you know, in the, in the late thirties or something like that be like, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to sign Greta Garbo because she doesn't want to work for MGM anymore or Warner brothers or something. Gotcha. They do it, you know, for those specific actors and actresses. So it's kind of all bets were off with them, but, Either way, at this point, she was with MGM, um, and she was she was still happy with it. It's kind of funny because she, at this point of her life, they're kind of saying, okay, she was kind of on a downswing in her career, and she was getting, you know, and, was like, and, and people think, like, she was getting older, and she, I'm like, she was 27 when this thing was made, I think, right yeah. around there. So yeah. she wasn't good, but they turned out pictures back then, like, you know, one after the other, a handful yeah. a year they come out with. So, doing for Sean Barrymore to do a three-picture deal with MGM is only like a year commitment for him, or two-year commitment. It wasn't that big of a deal, 
but he was like, screw it, whatever. He's like, whatever you offer me, he's like, I'll, I'll do it. I just want to be in a, in a movie with Greta Garbo. So he plays her main romantic interest in this movie. Um, Joan Crawford is actually, her and Lionel Barrymore, and let me get a little into the Barrymores. You know, Lionel Barrymore is John Barrymore's brother, and okay. they are all See, related. I, I, you know what? I saved to look into any of that because I wanted to ask you. Okay, they're brothers. All right. They're brothers, and they're, they're all part of the large Barrymore family. You know, Drew Barrymore is part of that family, came from that family. Uh, I think I think John Barrymore is her grandfather. Lionel Barrymore is like a great uncle or something of that nature. And Lionel Barrymore was a great actor in, in, in his own right. John Barrymore is more of your typical romantic lead in a movie. Lionel Barrymore didn't have quite the striking looks that John did. So Lionel kind of did some different uh, types of things. But either way, like him and Joan Crawford were probably the most impressive to me in this. And I have a little favoritism toward Joan Crawford because I always kind of, per there was always a little thing we know who's better, her or Betty Davis is kind of this little rivalry they had going. I always prefer Joan Crawford. I'm kind of in the minority there, but. And this was is, when it, she is, was, it, is it wrong that I like Mommy Dearest a lot? Why would that be wrong? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's such a good movie. I mean, I don't it know. It is a good movie. You know, and honestly, but like honestly, that time period, like you speak of, it's it's totally different than than anything that, that I can imagine that's going on today. So I'm with you. I've always been a big Joan Crawford Crawford, Crawford fan too. And this is kind of before she went a little, you know, people think, well, she went a little nuts or she started yeah. behaving oh, yeah. oddly. This is all before that all happened. Oh, yeah. She was, I mean, you, see, you saw the way she looked different here than she did, not oh, just in Mommy Dearest, but like in any movie she did, you know, 40s, 50s, whatever. Oh, sweet. Like she oh, looked, that, you know, whatever happened to Baby Jane. Yeah, yeah those she movies. Definitely, like, looks, definitely looks a lot different. She, this is pre, I mean, she was a star, but she wasn't like the superstar that she became until this movie came out and post this. Um, but those, but Joan Crawford and Lionel Barrymore were the most impressive to me in this movie, of this whole ensemble cast. Uh, Wallace Beery was in this movie, and he played a uh, director, I think we pronounce it Pricing. And he, so Joan Crawford's his stenographer is traveling with him. And this whole movie is about a group of people, like these five, basically, who are staying at the Grand Hotel in uh, Germany at the same time. And kind of their stories, it's about their stories intertwining, how they affect each other. I thought so, that was kind of cool how it didn't, I, you know, I was thinking that the movie was going to take place in America, but it took place in, in Germany, which I thought was yes. cool. It was different for, you know, for the time. I, I, it's cool that they did that. And each character was different in their own right. So not one character was alike with another one. Mm-hmm. So, like, Greta Garbo was a Russian ballet dancer who was kind of, uh, she was kind of on her way down as well, and she was kind of depressed, and this isn't a movie, not in real life, but um, in real life, she was kind of aloof anyway, but I don't think she was depressed or anything, but, um, so she was staying at the hotel, and, you know, John Barrymore is a baron, um, and he actually is in trouble because of uh, different gambling debts and things like that, debts he owes to different people. So because I'm not going to give away too much of the whole movie, but he needs money. So he's kind of a grifter. Um, he's basically like a cat burglar, too. And that's how he ends up meeting Greta Garbo in this movie. Um, this is kind of where you have to s suspend a little bit of reality because, you know, they kind of fall for each other. He falls for her kind of like almost seduces her in a way and she falls for a guy who is about to rob her, you know, like, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a little strange. Like you, you kind of got to, like I said, stretch your imagination out a little bit, but how, how that relationship develops. But in Joan Crawford's uh, Wallace Beery, the director of uh, a company, like his stenographer, he hires and it's implied that, you know, there's sexual things going on between them as well as part of her gig but you never actually see anything or it's not like said directly. But uh, Lionel Barrymore is a guy who, who has, who has an, uh, who's ailing and basically he's, he's dying. It's basically what's happening. He's dying. And so he's going to spend his money and have the best time he possibly can have until he does. So he is, 
a very sympathetic figure in the movie. Like he's definitely the face of this movie. The biggest heel and biggest, you know, villain I would say is Wallace Beery's character. Yes. Um, who Lionel Barrymore actually in his character in the movie worked for Wallace Beery's character. So he kind of knew what kind of guy he was, but Lionel Barrymore is definitely the most sympathetic figure in this film. And they portray him the whole way out as, as that. And John Barrymore, it's kind of funny because he, it's like he, do, he wants to do some despicable things. He kind of does. But at the same time, it's like you see like the good heart he has. Like there's one point where, you know, Lionel Barrymore drops his wall and kind of loses it. And John Barrymore is like, sweet, well, I can, you know, get this guy drunk, get, you know, he, and then, yeah, help get some of his winnings that he's getting at the tables. And he sees him drop his wallet. He's going to steal it. Then he kind of hears a story. He ends up liking him so much that he's like, he pretends like, oh, hey, old boy, I found your wallet. And here's your wallet back and everything. And it seems like Greta Garbo. He's going to steal stuff from something from her. And he ends up falling for her. So it's really interesting how the, the relationships in this movie but, develop, yeah. you know, because yeah. like, this is something, like I said, you know, what the thing you mentioned in the beginning was you've never you had to put yourself back in the 1930s which you really do for a couple of reasons one i've mentioned before and one of the things i've written is people don't talk that way anymore to each other they just no. don't no you don't they don't interact that way another thing is in the early 30s like i said it's still become the emphasis of talking movies there's a lot of pantomime still going on in these films so you would see a lot of, you know garba would do a lot of you know when she's upset about something, you know, you see her like flip her hair and like, you know, look off in another direction or put her arm over her head like this, like, you know, something's bothering her. There's a lot of pantomime going on, a lot of movement. Um, so you have to hit your, you know, the actors have to, you know, hit their marks all the time. And that's something that they still did in the thirties and they still did it in the forties and stuff too. But like, as, as time passed, you saw that kind of go away because, silent movies are basically stage plays and movie studios, you know, because there's no voicing. So you had to use your body. You had to move. You know, the movement was very important in uh, how you portrayed whatever character you were playing. But this movie was no different, but it did it pretty well and it didn't go overboard with it. Uh, the cinematography in this one's interesting too. Like if you see some of the camera shots in this, it was like, if you see a great shot of uh looking down on the basically the lobby of the hotel and the way it's shot is like wow you're like you know you never see anything like the way they zoom in and out and the, the scope of the lens they use but they spared no expense in this movie uh because obviously they gave a lot of money to these actors who were in it but yeah. they did get their money you know back from it and they won like I said best picture so they got what they wanted out of this and these stars definitely got what they wanted out of it too, because, you know, if someone thought Greta Garbo was on her way down, she kind of hopped back up on the wagon and yeah. was basically stayed where she was as an A-lister. Uh, Wallace Beery never did anything this good again, but he was kind of, uh, he still did, fi you know, movies after this. He died, I would say, you know, 15, 16 years later or whatever, but, he was always known as pretty difficult guy to work with. Like he was, he would do the dude was an asshole basically. Oh, really? <laughs> oh yeah. So I always you, like stories uh, like that. That's my favorite. Or the, uh, the yeah, the Wallace Fury was kind of like that. He, he, <laughs> I mean, hey, the dude brought it when hey, the camera yeah. was on. Yeah. But like what you saw on the camera was a lot like what he was in real life. Like art was imitating life for real in this case, you know. But John Barrymore was a was it was him and Greta Garbo got along swimmingly in this movie. And he loved working with her and she loved working with him. She was always, Greta Garbo was always known as kind of, you know, a person who was very reserved, uh, aloof. Mm -hmm. But, and then she had her moments where she was kind of, you know, nasty as some people on screen. But like, you know, Joan Crawford like worshipped her. Like she was like so happy to work with her. And she was pretty cold to Joan Crawford initially. But uh, it, they kind of worked. But it, it wasn't like, you know, a thing where she was just, you know, dismissive. Well, she was kind of dismissive, but it wasn't like an ass to her, like purpose. That was just the way she was. That was the way she acted. Gotcha. So, but then it, it kind of, you know, she kind of grew on her and she respected her a little bit more for what she, you know, because she saw if she had to have seen it, you know, in, what, what kind of caliber of actress she was. Yeah. So amazing. 
you had the guys like Lewis Stone, Gene Hirschholt, and Lewis, um, they're you know the supporting characters. But this movie was dominated by the actual stars, okay. and it had to be. The supporting cast was kind of just there to move the plot along. But well, here, it's sorry, was that what I was going to do? Is here is I got a couple four clips here to play you. Okay. You tell me what you think of these clips. Here's the first one here. Let's see if this works. I wondered what had happened to that old porter if somebody jumped on him from here. I'm sure I don't know. Why don't you try it and find out? Did you hear that part? Yes. <laughs> so that is uh, with Joan Crawford and John Barrymore. Yep. And uh, Joan Crawford, like, he meets her before he, John Barrymore meets her in a movie before Greta Garbo, and he kind of tries to hook up with her first so so yeah the dude was, I was trying to be smooth all over this movie well uh, yeah and, and he was you know he was very smooth but, uh, time. and yeah. he would let to be known i'm a baron you know <laughs> so like they knew who he was just that but, term anymore dude does anyone still use those terms baron is that is that still a is, yeah, are there barons so, still around i don't know if they, there's got to be barons or so, you know <laughs> I know in, uh, I mean, it takes place in the Gilded Age, granted that, but the Age of Innocence, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's character, is, she was married, to, she's a baroness, because she was married to a Hungarian baron. Okay. And, that you know, sense. that's what she was getting away from in that movie. But I'm not sure, I mean, there's got, there's still, I'm sure there's still titles <laughs> of that in Europe, but I mean, I'm sure they also they don't really have nearly as many responsibilities or anything like they used to, kind of like the royal family in England, where they're kind of just, you know... Oh, yeah. The monarchy is just kind of there, and they're you know respected, but they don't really make decisions on what goes on, you know. <laughs> but um, jo- Joan Crawford was good in this because she could go toe to toe with like John Barrymore. So it's a very, if you noticed, and I'm sure you did, like it was a very uh, kind of fun interaction between them, a little back and forth. Yeah, you know, kind of one up you and one up you here, but that kind of faded off once he met Greta Garbo. Yeah. So then he turns into a total like well, you, know, you don't take a three picture deal to go with Joan Crawford at the time, you know, it was Garbo. You know, he was it waiting. was Garbo. He was waiting for Garbo. Here's uh, the second clip here. Here we go. We were drilled like little soldiers. No rest, no stop. I was little and slim, but hard as a diamond. Yeah, that's uh well that's Greta kind of reminiscing about how she used to be because her career is on the wane. I really like her. I really like, you know, it's again, it's something they don't do anymore, but like nobody's got a voice like that or acts like that in a movie anymore. Well, she was, she learned English in the early 20s. I mean, she was, she was Swedish. Yeah. So she came into Hollywood and she, you know, she didn't know English when she first, which it didn't matter. You know, when you did silent movies, it it didn't matter if you knew English or not. So, that's another thing that people don't realize is a lot of these actors and actresses that were, you know, big in the twenties and silent era, a lot of them didn't make it over to sound films because they didn't know, you know, Hollywood dominated back then. And like, if they didn't know they couldn't speak English or we can go for any movie, you know, I mean, which I didn't think of, I guess, either for the silent movies is you didn't need to speak English. For this no, you didn't. No. You can mouth whatever you want. And that, uh, that title, those cards will come up and say whatever they need you to say. Yeah. Very, so, very but she, but Greta Garbo, you know, but she, it, the thing about her is she did transcend both because her voice was very, you know, when you, we, long, how many people, you got to think about this too, back in 1932, people, how many people heard in the United States heard Swedish people talk before? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like it is nowadays, you know? Mm-hmm. So you hear people not talk a whole lot at all. No, you yeah. probably didn't have you know access Especially to the silent movies and going to the show and I'm other sure than that, neighbors. Just, hey, yeah. that's my new neighbor. He's from Sweden. You know, nothing. Yeah, you just knew that. the people that you knew, and that was pretty much it. You didn't really, you know, no yeah. foreign yeah. people unless they came here for whatever reason. So, but she was a uh, definitely awesome, though. I definitely yeah. like her performance. I mean, you're right; it isn't the best out of everybody, but it still makes the movie, I think, pretty pretty good, pretty solid. Yeah, it, it it does adjust it. She just she certainly doesn't hinder none none of the performances hinder the film in any way in this no, you know not at all. Not at all. So like you know, there's no part you're watching, you're like, Well, this person's on screen now, so I'm just gonna be like, Oh, let's wait for you know, <laughs> you're not you're not. It's just, everyone's interesting, intriguing, 
the stories are intriguing and how you know they interact with each other is the most intriguing part so here is uh here is the third clip here we go you are more of a coquette not so ladylike <laughs> what did you expect wouldn't you like to call me by the first name? Well, I don't know what he wants. I never saw him before. I know you. I've kept your books for you, and I know all about you. If one of your employees was half... <laughs> yeah, so that's... that. Let me go to the end of that first. That's yeah. that's Lionel Barrymore, yeah. who I mentioned he's, earlier. He was worked. probably... Honestly, he was probably my favorite in the movie. That whole part right there was my favorite. Yeah, it was, it was Kringlein. <laughs> I love saying this name, Kringlein. <laughs> um, but he worked for Wallace Berry's character precinct in that movie. So, but that was kind of the hinting of toward, you know, do you want to call me by my first name? Cause he was trying to like, you know, Hey, I know you're my stenographer and you're working for me, but you know, he mentioned, you know, something being ladylike and not ladylike. And that's when she was like, well, what'd you expect? And he was like, why don't you call him by my first name? You know, and if you saw, you know, you know, his character in that movie, he doesn't want anyone calling him by his first name, you know? No. No, not at all. So he was definitely trying to, you know, get in her honey pot, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, I like but yeah. how the movie's in black and white. And then if you see here in this middle copy when they re released it in the color, I like like John Barry more, how he like, he more, you know, like everyone is, it's more in color than, I mean, I love the black and white too. It's very, it was awesome. Just an awesome movie all around, I think. It was and like you, the, and the, you know a lot of people don't realize the clothing they wore back then too. Yeah, they had to make sure that the whites and the, you know things that appeared white, things that appeared gray, and things that appeared black. No matter you know if you're wearing blue, red, like if you're wearing like a light red, it's gonna appear gray. So they made sure they had to wear certain things. You know, I, I was reading that I think it was in both in seventy eight and eighty one. Norman Jewison wanted to remake the movie but he couldn't get it off the ground as a movie. yeah which honestly I'm, I'm not that heartbroken over that no i know i mean no because um, it's like i said it's just one of those movies and maybe they could have made a uh well usually maybe, when they do something like that they're going to take away from the magic of what the original one was yeah so you don't ever want to take the magic away no. if, if you if you make a good version of it that that's fine but we we all know like it's never gonna be as good as the original yeah, so true. why, you know, why tempt fate like that? And I'm sure it, 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 no matter how good it was, it would have been critically panned. It's, it's one of those things. Yeah, no, I definitely, definitely agree. But yeah, man, really good movie. That was a good pick. Yeah, it was an excellent movie. The The runtime is it's not like a three hour movie or anything like that. The runtime. Um, plus, you know, back when they didn't make, you know, when they started making talking movies, the runtimes weren't ever excessive. Because, like I said, they wanted to make as many movies as possible. Get them all out. You can see your stars, see them talk. Um, and that, that was thing actually set, that sold. Uh, so, like when Greta Garbo made Anna Christie, that was her first talking movie. Um, it was like Garbo talks. And there's a movie that she makes where like, well, Garbo laughs. You know, it's like this is a movie. You know, that that's how they sold these movies back then. Because these people were all silent film stars. It's like now you get to see them talk and do things that you didn't see before and they interact in ways that never were able to before. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's why I think I like doing these little pieces with you is because like a movie like this, I definitely think it's you can go back and take a look at it because like you said, it was the original Ocean's Eleven. I also heard somebody compare it to like Gosford Park. Um you know, what it is, is I like you said, it was the big movie stars of the time all getting together for one movie, which definitely yeah. made it. And when I say it was like the first, it, it was nothing like Ocean's Eleven, obviously, but like it was no. just the ensemble cast was, yeah. was kind of what I was referring to. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's obviously not a casino heist. I guess it's more sometimes when you get a bunch of big actors in a room together, sometimes they don't play like they don't play well is what I mean, like. These all five of the actors, I think, did a good job with each other in the movie, which is also like the key of why Ocean's Eleven is so good because the actors work well together. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of big ensemble movies I've seen, and it, it kind of like sludges along. This definitely, I don't think, did that, like you said, with the runtime. No, and it, it's good, you know, 
like these actors knew they weren't going to always be in situations where they're going to be in a film with four other A-listers or anything like oh, yeah. that. So they had no problem doing one like this. Yeah. And yeah. they looked at it like it's kind of a badge of honor going, well, they wanted me to, you know, be with these people. I'm included in this group, you know, almost like being part of the Rad Pack or something like it's, I'm part of this. And, you know, I have that over anybody else, you know, of that, of that era. So they, they, they all, if you read different uh, experiences the actors had in the movie, they all, they all, they all said they had a good time. So it was Edmund Golding uh, directed it. And he kind of just let them, it was more like he just let the actors do their thing. That's what I was actually going to ask you. Yeah, because the directors back then too, like you know, they they were directing things, but they weren't. It wasn't like their film vision, like kind of like how it is now. It wasn't their vision, you know. It's like here, it's written. You organize. They were organizers more than anything, you know. And when when the early films came out like this, not all of them, but a lot of them, you know, especially with star power like this, because like I said, the studios had their idea of what they wanted to do. It was a machine. They wanted stuff churned out make as much money as possible. So they said, you make it work. You make these people get along. You let, if there's egos, you make it work between all of them. And he did a good job of doing that. So he was never, um, like, like I said, he was never nominated for best director for the movie. He wasn't, I mean, not that it's, and like I said, it's not that he didn't win. He wasn't even nominated. Yeah, that's None cool. of these people were even nominated. <laughs> John Barrymore, you know, what, uh, John Barrymore, Lionel Barrymore, like you know, he was awesome. Wasn't yeah. even nominated. Even thought about. I have to go back and do some research on who they were against, and it seems to be a crime. Yeah, and but like it's, but look, 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 hey, look, like, Citizen Kane didn't win Best Picture either. It lost. Yeah, that's true. A yeah. lot, of, a lot of things like a lot of my favorite movies aren't even nominated, and yeah, like, movies, so it doesn't always have to be that way. You know? No, you ask people you know, how good, how many times they've watched How Green Is My Valley, you know. And that was directed <laughs> by John Ford. Yeah. But that wasn't nearly the movie that Citizen Kane was. No. No. And, and, no. and time, that's what I'm saying. I don't take those things too seriously because certain people win. Adrian Brody is a great actor. He was awesome, the pianist. But he was not as good as Daniel Day-Lewis. Not even remotely. Wasn't the same ballpark, wasn't the same fucking sport. Okay, well, since now, uh, really quick, well, while I wrap up the really good, the Grand Hotel is awesome. Check out the Grand Hotel um, from 1932. Go back and watch it. Um, back to the topic in which you said really quick here. Are you So you don't think Adrian Brody is in the same ballpark? No, his performance in The Pianist. You don't think it's in that? You don't think the, his performance in The Pianist is in the same ballpark as uh, Daniel Day-Lewis and Gangs of New York? No, not really. Okay, okay. So let's go. Gangs of New York against There Will Be Blood. Are those two performances in the same category? Yes. You don't think There Will Be Blood is like a lot better than? Not not his individual performance. No. Gotcha. Hey. Now I love There Will Be Blood is probably still. I mean that came out what two thousand eight, yeah, two thousand seven, right on there. Yeah. Um. That's probably still one of my favorite movies of the last twenty years. Oh man, I mean that's like that's a that's a really 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 good movie. But look, and, and the thing is, it's very similar to like how he, you know, Daniel Day Lewis. We all know what you know, kind of an actor he is. He he manipulated his own voice to, like Daniel Plainview sounds a lot like you know, like Bill the Butcher kind of the way oh, he, he made that. Yeah. So he goes really outside of himself to make those things work. But Bill the Butcher, I mean that dude. In, in the in the movie he was in with the actors he was in that movie and the guy who directed him, he still stole every single scene he was in. Everything every time. That's true. You know? I mean it it's it's you know, I I I don't I've only watched the penis a couple times. I've watched Kings of New York a whole lot more. Um Penis is just such a it's a you I mean, it's a movie where I can't really talk about the director anymore i know that for sure <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's certainly because adrian Brody, like his character you're, you're going through a journey in that film you know and you're following i think it's more of just like mentally back to the empathy thing him in that apartment yeah and like him just in that apartment um and up until that point but 
I mean, Bill the Butcher's amazing. Well, I can um, see someone else playing Adrian Brody's character. Oh yeah, that's that true movie, too. Or I can't see anyone playing Bill the Butcher. No, you're right. That is that is a, that is an amazing, amazingly fair, fair point. Um, just there's a lot of like in this movie right before you explain it. Just it's a lot of subtleties that I, I really really enjoy. Um, why don't you give me a backdrop on the movie here? So the movie itself, the basic plot to it is: it's Sidney Poitier is in the South visiting family, and it takes place in Mississippi. The city is called Sparta, Mississippi, and it's a fictional city, but it's based off of a real city, which is Sparta, Illinois. Sparta, Illinois is it was the, the movie itself was filmed in Sparta, Illinois, because they really couldn't film in Mississippi because there were there was a lot of racial tension back then. And actually, Sidney Poitier and uh, Harry Belafonte ran into had a little run in with Klansmen down in Mississippi before. So they didn't really want to film down there. So they use a city um, in Illinois and it's a rural city. It's just it's just a little south. If I'm not mistaken, it's a little southeast of St. Louis. So it's pretty close to the border over there. And for most of the shoot, uh, a little bit of it went into Tennessee. But even in Tennessee, they ran a little bit of problems, too. And which mirrors the problems in the movie itself. You know, so it's kind of odd that, like, you know, even the, filming something like that, you get uh, you get that idea of what these people were going through down there at that time. And, you know, just and this is just post Civil Rights Act, you know, Mississippi. So it's it's a rough area for people of, you know, of color. And, you know, but he's a detective from, I think, Pennsylvania. And he's down there visiting family. And there's a murder in this small town of Sparta. And one of the officers actually sees him at a train station, just a black guy just sitting in a train station alone. So he automatically suspects him of something, so he brings him in. And the, the, actually, the officer who does bring him in is Warren Oates, who was in, you know, Warren Oates was in a handful of things as well. And he was in the Wild Bunch. Um, Stripes. In Peckinpah. Yeah, he was in Stripes. Uh, he was in the, he played Dillinger in the Dillinger movie from the 70s. Yeah. Um, East of Eden, 1941, actually, with Spielberg's 1941. Bring me um, the head he, of, El, you have to bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. Yeah. Sam Peckinpah, that's pretty good. Love Sam Peckinpah. But um, Monty Python did a great skit about Sam Peckinpah, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but Warren Oates was actually a civil rights, a kind of a civil rights activist himself. So it, it was it was kind of weird to see him, you know, play, a, you know, that type of role in the movie. But he was terrific in it as kind of a, you know, a racist, but a bumbling cop. But he brings him in and... Uh, he gets pretty much uh, exonerated and because, you know, he meets up with, uh, he brings him into Rod Steiger, who's the chief of police of Sparta. And Rod Steiger is absolutely, Rob Steiger, Rob Steiger is my favorite character in this movie is uh, Chief Gillespie. Um, he actually spoke in a Southern accent throughout the whole shoot just to keep it as basically as natural and as authentic as he could. He did a great job with it. He's an underrated he, actor, too. Another Well, yeah, actor. I mean, you know, but, and before that even, you know, he did, uh, he was in The Longest Day. He was in uh, The Pawn Broker. It's The Pawn Broker's a fantastic movie. Yes, that's a great, great movie. Uh, I actually, for a little bit, was a pawnbroker, and my boss was like, you got to watch The Pawn Broker, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, but he's also really good in, um, uh, what was it, uh, On the Waterfront. On the waterfront, he was known, you know, he's definitely known for that. And uh, Dr. Zhivago. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite David Lane movies, Dr. Zhivago, he was in that. Um, and actually, they had they wanted George C. Scott to play Gillespie initially, but he was committed to something else, so they brought in Rod Steiger. But Rod Steiger did a great job of, uh, if, if, you, if you listen to his vocal, basically his vocal mannerisms in this movie, he's very quick. He's very quick with everything. So his lines are all delivered very quickly. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so, you know, and he just, uh, he really, really is a great 
um, opposite for Sidney Poitier in the movie. And you kind of see that um, evolution and metamorphosis of first he has nothing but disdain for him, and then he grows to kind of respect him and then rely on him. And then towards the end, he, you know, he kind of just likes him. And, you know, the end scenes like, you know, he tells him, he's like, hey, just take care of yourself, Virgil. You know, he called, you know. But so the movie's a murder mystery. And Sidney Poitier is ordered kind of by his own captain up north to help them down here with this. And we're well, not really ordered to, but he was like, you know, he's at your disposal if you need him. And, you know, being a Southern police chief, Rod Steiger's character, Gillespie, was kind of like, no, you know, we don't want to do that. Then all of a sudden he's like, you know what, maybe we do need this guy because he is a forensics expert. And there's things that, that he could do that they had no, you know, they didn't know what forensics even really was. And they, they were, you know. So you see Sidney Poitier throughout the movie do his job as he normally would, but facing resistance every step of the way from, you know, the locals down there. But in, Nor in the guy who filmed this, Norman Jewison, who I want to talk about for a second. That, that, that's what I was looking at right now as you were talking. I was looking down, and I, I'm a fool because I know, you know, I, you know, until we you picked this movie, I, I didn't realize, and I had been on a big Norman Jewison going through his movies recently, and I don't know why the hell, man, I, I've seen this movie. I don't know why I didn't know off the top of my head he directed it. So it was cool. It was really cool. Yeah, Norman Jewison... He was kind of known for directing movies that were that you know with had significant social issues at the time he films them. Like the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming into that one, you know, in the mid sixties. Uh, you know, one of my favorites we've talked about a handful of times, Rollerball, about how corporations, you know, taking over and taking away individuality of people and stuff like that. You know, he did that. I'm a big uh, fan of uh, Pacino and Injustice for All. Injustice for All, that's a great one too, man. Um, um, the way that that. When he freaks out at the end of the movie, man, it's great. Um, yeah, I've watched a lot recently for, there, for a romantic movie, Moonstruck. Movie, he does a good job. Yeah, he did Moonstruck. Dude, the guy's yeah. still alive. He's, yeah, he's going to be nine, what ninety seven this year? 96? I think he's born twenty twenty six or something. Like so we just brought alive. him up a second ago. I did not know until looking down here. I don't know why I didn't pay attention. I did not know he did Denzel in the Hurricane. Oh yeah, he did the Hurricane. That's kind of his last big movie, I think. Yeah, I mean, but but like but again. Still, that, just that's another social issue he to tackled. All those movies. The Cincinnati but, Kid, that's pretty good. A uh, card playing movie with Steve Yeah, Green. Cincinnati Kid, he filmed that one a few years a few years before it in the heat of the night. Yeah. And okay. but like I said, you know, he's he's done a lot of movies that tackle different social issues, and he was never fancy with uh his shots of the camera. I mean, his biggest contribution, I think, behind the camera was he was great at showing tension by shooting with you know close-ups and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, not not like dolly shot close-ups, but just you know close-ups to increase tension in the movie. Plus, he um, the heat of the night was it, it's an odd it's an odd little nugget here, but in the heat of the night was one of the first movies that was lit um, appropriately for actors of color, whether they're Ooh. Hispanic or if they're Hispanic or African American or whatever. Because before, if you watch a lot of movies, like you can see something like in a you can watch any older movie that was even in color where when people are lit, it's real shiny off their face. It's just not yeah. lit correctly. They didn't care. They just kept doing it because it makes other actors look okay. It, it, it takes extra work to adjust to that. Yeah. This was the first movie where you saw someone of color be like lit correctly. And you don't notice really it, it's something like that until you watch this movie compared to, uh, to other ones previous to that. And even some after it too. But it really worked with Sidney Poitier's character, you know. He's he's lit correctly. Um, if you watch a movie like uh, West Side Story, now West Side Story, they did you know like makeups and stuff to make them look more Puerto Rican. They weren't really even Puerto Rican, like a lot, a lot of them. But even you see the way they're lit, their like their heads are real. It's like real shiny. Everything's real shiny. Yeah. So this he's was got, so he got that he got the lighting perfect on this one. He did, and and it wasn't. And the thing is. It's a movie where, with locations and the sets, you don't need to worry a lot about the lighting. There wasn't, like I said, there wasn't a lot. There weren't a lot of fancy shots or anything of that nature. It's pretty straight up, a lot of medium shots. Um, but Norma Jewison kind of just knew what he had and what kind of movie it was. The movie didn't require that type of stuff. 
it wasn't about that. It was about something else. You know, it's about the interaction between the characters themselves and the evolution of how Gillespie, not the townsfolk so much, the townsfolk still see him in a certain way because they don't get to know him like Gillespie does. It's Gillespie and, uh, you know, Virgil Tibbs, their relationship and how it evolves throughout the film and how he, you know, after he leaves, you suspect, hey, this guy has a lot of respect for this guy, or this guy after this. And maybe his views on black people, you know, were obviously skewed from where he came from and maybe a little bit incorrect. Uh, the show that, you know, in the Heat of the Night show starring Carol O'Connor. That's know, that, what I wanted to bring up, too. What do you that think was, about that? Well, it, it's, it's a good show, but I mean, it, it doesn't really, it's completely different. Like, Gillespie's a completely different character. And Tibbs is a different character. It's like a partner crime drama, you know, mm. like any type of show like that. So it's a good show, but it, it doesn't you know, it doesn't really reflect what In the Heat of the Night did socially. Gotcha. So, so In the Heat of the Night kind of just like, you know, since murder's involved as well, I mean, it really just case you right in the face. And, you know, one of my favorite scenes, it's, it's I mean, a great the time, scene. The time period, too. I mean, it's, as you stated earlier, guess, you know, this and guess who's coming out, you know, to dinner, coming out at the same, you know. The same time, you know. Yeah, I mean, Sydney's and, taking, and, and then Sydney's tackles two different dance, things. You know, that's pretty you know, awesome. awesome. There's one situation where you're, you've got a murder and you suspect foul play from this person because he's black. And guess who's coming to dinner? You're just, it's Spencer Tracy, you know, and uh, Catherine Hepburn. And, and, and they're just basically trying to come to terms with their, with their white daughter being in love with a black man. So it's, they're different subject matters. Yeah. But it's still, it, you know, yeah. it's still oh, yeah. about, you know, race and, and being accepting of people of other color and other cultures and stuff. And that came, that came out at the same time is pretty significant. You got, and, you got you got Quincy Jones doing the soundtrack for In the Heat of the Night. That's pretty huge. I mean, yeah. for I mean, you know, this movie is a lot of top, you know, Academy Awards. You know, I mean, Best Picture. I mean, you're you're you're, you're saying you know, right? No, no, it didn't win. But did it win Best Picture? Mm, I don't know if it's won Best. You know, you don't mean the Oscar. Isn't that really? Oh, I know you're not really yeah, picture but, or not, but no. I, mean, I know some of them. It it did. I know Rod Steiger won. You know, Rod Steiger, I think won, yeah. won for best sound, best film editing, um, stuff along those lines. I mean, yeah, you know, pretty, pretty, you know. Yeah, like pretty, I said, it wasn't it wasn't time. filmed in, in a very fancy manner. He just he shot the way he needed to to show the tension, and he still won an award for best editing. I mean, it was just, um, it was a very, it, it seemed like it was an easy movie. To make in film, besides the fact that you you had it, you know you couldn't do it actually in the location you wanted to in Mississippi because of like I said racial tension then, but uh, Sidney Poitier he really made a name for himself in the late fifties early you know in the sixties through this and he didn't do much you know like I said in the eighties I mean he didn't I mean shoot to kill you know he did that in the eighties but like oh, that was a decent movie but you know but it, it wasn't very there's nothing as nearly as prominent. It's almost like he peaked back then, and it wasn't his fault, but it's for what he stood for, what in the movies he made back then that resounded so much with audiences, and especially the black community, that it's almost like, how do you, where do you go from there, you know? Oh, yeah. Now, you bring up Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington is probably the modern-day Sidney Poitier, you know? Yeah. He, and Because they, they all play very similar characters. The, my problem with, um, I'm just going back to Denzel real quick. Yeah. My issue with Denzel is I don't, and maybe it's not his fault, but I mean, he chooses what he wants to make. He's usually the same character in every movie, you know, he's the same personality. He did, he hasn't shown me like a lot of like, you know, comedic Vers range. Vers versatility. Yeah, a lot of versatility. Me and my friend John got into a discussion a long time ago about between Leonardo DiCaprio and Denzel Washington, like who's a better actor. And then we were talking, and as we were talking about it, we realized that. DiCaprio it seems whether you think he's a better actor at Denzel or not, but like he has a better range than he does, you know. So I wish he would venture out in a different genre. So you, you don't think? Okay, take for instance, you got Training Day, which mm -hmm. he, he's. You don't think that's different than let's say this right here? Hold on. Is a brilliant lawyer, great lawyer. Point number two: Andrew Beckett, afflicted with a debilitating disease, may the understandable be personal. The legal choice to keep the fact 
of his illness to himself. Point number three, his employers discovered his illness. And ladies and gentlemen. So, I mean, like, I understand, you know, I mean, I get what you're saying. A lot of, is, and I'm with you on a lot. I, I, I like Denzel a whole lot. Denzel, Denzel, he's But Denzel very, reminds he, me a little bit. Do you think, what about Tom Hanks' range? Do you think he's got a huge range? Or do you think it's Tom pretty, Hanks has a better range. I mean, you look at Tom Hanks in Philadelphia, you look at Tom Hanks in Splash, or you look at him in something like Forrest Gump. I mean, these are completely different characters, different. The thing Whereas, that Denzel doesn't have, I'm trying to think of, does that Denzel off the top of my head, he doesn't have like good comedies, heartfelt, everything's in the drama category. Yeah, and tra- I mean, Training Day was one of the movies where he was actually, you know, the heavy. You know, he's not often that in the movie. He's usually a protagonist, but he's always very confident in what he's saying. His speech patterns usually, even that speech like you saw, you heard there in Philadelphia, if you listen to that and put the next to his speech when he's talking to um, Ethan Hawke or something in Training Day. Uh, you're right. I mean, you know, it, it's it's the same. It's like you know what's very... funny. You know what's what's funny is I pulled the clip to try to go against what you were saying, and then I heard it. And what I heard was is, but what I will say is that he's doing it. It is the same, but it's but always he's very me. good at it. He's it reminds me almost reminds me a lot of like ACDC sometimes, where it is the same. But I mean, if you're paying attention, it, there is differences to it. But I could see the same it, it's not i mean leo is throwing different roles like leo gets involved with a lot of um you know different different stuff different types of projects and uh you know they're but like it's denzel's very 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 good at what he does and if you have a character that kind of you need that type of an actor to do it or you know what i'm trying to say is you know if you need that type of uh confidence in an actor or something or well, that that's type what of he is, pattern. He... you get that guy because like that guy you're like boom denzel that's a perfect guy for that movie he was just unbelievable in the last king of scotland yeah and i mean james mcavoy's good at that too but like forrest whitaker is ed i mean was just just crazy good i don't he was know also why, i don't know great. why i love him so much and i love him a lot even though it's a very very small role but the uh, color of money um, yeah, when he's the hustler, that yeah, yeah. like he was he, good in that. And another small role he had, a little bit more prominent, but it was still kind of a small role that he was I thought he was very very good in was uh, in the Crying Game with Stephen. Yes. Funny, 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 and funny. And, funny. and obviously, we saw him. You know, Fast Times at Ridgemont High is kind of when you first saw him and he came out like that. But uh, funny story back to the Crying Game. Um, back in that early nineties period when I'm 11 or 12, me and my mom would just rent movies from the video store, like murder mysteries. And we rented mm-hmm. the crying game movie changed me at 11 or 12. She's like, you should probably leave the, the room for this scene. And I didn't. And I think you did, did, did. no. And then for the rest of, for the rest of my life, I would just make, you know, crying game jokes. But I'm assuming stuff. at that time, well, no, because I've been around around the same time that Ace Ventura came out. Well, yeah. well, yeah, yeah. You know what's sad is I never really put the two together until I was way later, you know? But well, I didn't because I saw Ace Ventura first, and then you hear the Crying Game song. Well, yeah. Well, the that's, game there we movie. go. That, that's that's yeah. what it is. That's, and, and even more hilarious, no, well, not really hilarious, but, you know, Boy George sings the Crying Game, mm-hmm. does the Crying Game song. But, uh, Another deep, deep, deep actor that I enjoy a lot, who's um, in one of your favorite directors, who would be celebrating a birthday today. Um, Twitter won't let me post the thing because it, it was having trouble posting. But today would have been Milos Foreman's birthday. A uh, Scatman Crothers in One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest. Big fan oh, of him yeah. in that movie, The Shining. Scatman is, he's the man. I love Scatman. Milos Foreman was in a... Uh... They had they interviewed him in one of my that Charlie Chaplin documentary I was talking to you about. He was a big Charlie Chaplin fan. Um, obviously, we've mentioned uh, Amadeus before. I love Amadeus. You oh, know, Milos yeah, Forman right. did some. Uh, Milos Forman did some great movies, and but he did Man on the Moon too, didn't he? He did. He yeah, did that was Man one of his. Yeah, he did Man on the Moon, um, which was all right. But I mean, you know, for what it was, for I remember was. when I seen it the first time. I wasn't like. And I loved Andy Kaufman. I just wasn't extremely blown away by the movie. But the more I watch it, it's 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 good. You know, what, yeah, what about people? Do you like that better than People versus Larry Flint? A Man, the Moon. Yeah. No. No. 
I thought People versus Lawyer Flint was better. Um, they're both good movies, but uh, I saw that one at River Oaks. That was a with but see, Man on the Moon is one of those where you don't really think about the direct. You think more about Jim Carrey's performance and that more than anything else, you know. So, but you know, that, and that's fine because Milos Forman. A lot of these directors realize sometimes, hey, I have a thoroughbred here, and in this specific role, it's perfect for him. Let him run with it rather than try to over direct them, you know. But a uh, couple, couple things here uh, b- before we go. Um, number one, I was going to say is Lawrence Fishburne and Angela Bassett were the parents in Boys in the Hood. Mm-hmm. Um, what was their second team-up movie that they teamed up in together? Angela Bassett and him? Oh, was it... Uh, she was won... Got a groove back, was it? Uh, no, she no, won best. She won one. best... So I'm thinking of Strange. She was in Strange she Day. Best, uh, she won best actress for this movie. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. It's one of my favorites. What's love got to do with it? You ever see the Ike? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> now, yeah. really quickly here for my actress pick here is oh, yeah, Angela he, yeah. Bassett. Um, I don't know why I love this movie so much. It's um, Ike Turner. His performance is Ike Turner, and her mm. performance as Tina Turner are extremely, extremely, extremely ridiculous. And she's – I know you're not up for the uh, whole awards thing, but uh, she's up for – for uh, an Academy Award. Oh yeah, I saw that. I, you know, I liked her in like the movie. Like I mentioned a minute ago, "Strange Days" with Ray Fiennes. Oh, just actually within the last month, that's on HBO. Watch that. Uh, yeah, that's, watch that, that again. That's a movie um, that kind of got Lewis over, man. In that movie. What you it, was, it was a very. It got kind of passed over. You know, yeah. like if you watch, it, like pretty damn cool. You know. Well, what I name, also, um, you know what? Honestly, Angela Bassett. Here's what I think of Angela Bassett the most in. This is really weird. But I think of the Jacksons in American Dream. That movie's awesome. That whole two parter. Oh, I could tell you, I could that movie, and I've watched the Temptations one more, the one that was like on TV. But uh, that American Dream was really, was a really, really, really good. um, That was a really good movie. I remember watching it when it was actually on, too. And she was in the score with, you know, she was De Niro's girlfriend in the score. Oh, that's a good movie too. Yeah, like it, it's she's on she's on some cool things, but it's like recently you haven't heard much about her until no. this year again. Like no, she, so it's nice to see her. Well, I think a lot of do times, something. Unfortunately, I hate to use this, but they 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 like they, they don't treat they don't treat uh old you know they don't treat uh actresses sometimes you know there's roles out there and they just don't don't give them to them any you know they just once you get a little bit older they start to like less and less and that's why. It's awesome when you're, uh, you know, you're a uh, B. Yeah, because you, can, you a lot of them. Get I forgot she was as... with Denzel and Malcolm X too. Yeah, she was um, in Malcolm X. We mentioned that. You, uh, Spike Lee. You like any Spike Lee movies? Yeah, I like some Spike Lee movies. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are, are really, really uh, clockers. That one's pretty. Uh, him and Scorsese working together. Um, before we uh, go here, I was going to ask you about uh, you. Uh, you like let's see here a couple movies here i was gonna pull up here before we we go here where'd you go here uh where am i at? we're all going oh there we go all right uh eddie murphy raw you ever see that oh i've ever seen Eddie murphy raw raw delirious all me out they're awesome classic classic uh you ever watch any of like the the richard Pryor stuff mm-hmm Big stand-up fan I am. Um, I've seen all fan. that stuff. Um, I've always been a huge George Carlin guy, too. You know, Bill Hicks. We both like Bill Hicks a lot. Oh, Bill, Bill Hicks is... So I there, there was a time where me, here. my brother, and a couple of friends of mine were, were just watching a ton of stand, different stand-up stuff from, like, you oh, know, yeah. Sam Kinison was a huge one um, from the 80s, 70s, where we was watching a bunch of... Even Red Fox. Um, I have a... Re- if you've never seen this movie, I have a request. It's on HBO Max. It stars Carl Weathers and Craig T. Nelson, Action Jackson. No, I've seen Action Jackson. Action Jackson's great. We used to make Action Jackson jokes, yes. but <laughs> Action Jackson is uh, very, 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 very awesome. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we definitely we definitely got to the, some good stuff here today. 